hello hello welcome back to another episode of general conference conversations where we have conversations about general conference i'm your host kaylin and i am super excited to be here with you studying the words of christ's chosen leaders so let's get right into it today we are talking about elder holland's talk and i'm super excited about this talk um I love Elder Holland and his talks are always ones that I look forward to. Um, just the power with which he speaks in like, he just has a very unique way of, you know, getting your attention. Um, and that also means that we are in officially started the Saturday or the Sunday morning session of conference, which is so crazy to think that we are already on the Sunday sessions. Um, which means we only have let's see, there's seven at talks in this one, and I think eight in the last one. So, what 15 talks left? Um, which you know sounds like a lot when I say it like that, but um, it'll go fast. It will. So I'm excited and crazy that we're already here and that um, conference is in just a couple of months. Um, so speaking of, if you're getting ready for conference, if you're here because you've stumbled upon, you know, you realize that it's getting close and you want to, you know, say the talks more, um, I also have a study guide to go along with this. Um, it's available as a PDF, like downloadable version that you can print out yourself or you can get a physical copy. Um, and both of those links are, will be in the description of the, this episode and the video. So if you're interested in that, um, but we're going to move right into other Holland's talk. And as always, I encourage you to listen to and or read this talk before you come and listen to me talk about it just so you can get your own insights and um revelation and direction um yourself before you come and listen to me <laughs> talk about things and hopefully i can add to it um, and maybe ask questions that you didn't think about asking so his whole talk is called lift up upon the cross and that's really what it's talking about. He talks about the cross. And I've noticed that Elder Holland does this quite a lot. Um, I don't know if it's just kind of one of his things or if it's kind of one of his callings or if it's, he just gets a lot of questions. <laughs> um, but he often will take um, like a frequently asked question about our beliefs and give a talk about it. Um, for example, he gave a two-parter I want to say one was in like an April conference and one was an October conference about um, basically why we're still considered Christian. Um, he had had somebody ask us that, like ask him that, like, well, why aren't you Christian? He's like, we, we are. Um, but he goes through some kind of specific things about like the Godhead and the Trinity and like kind of the the cornerstones of what people usually consider to be Christian and like why sometimes it's hard to reconcile that. And so I've noticed he does he does that a lot where he's like, well people always ask me or like we're we're constantly asked or kind of things like that. It's like clearing the air, clearing things up in a very doctrinally sound and also very powerful way. And so his question this time um, he talks specifically, but I'm sure he's gotten this question a lot. He talks specifically about this one instance um, when he was in graduate school um, and a fellow student asked him why our church doesn't usually wear the cross um, as a symbol of our faith and of our religion. And he kind of, <laughs> he kind of goes on to say, like, I immediately told him, you know, that we are committed to Christ. That's not, like, that shouldn't, that, that shouldn't, um, confuse people. Like, we don't use it because we don't believe in Christ or we're not committed to Christ. We are. Um, and that we are, you know, very, very committed to Christ and we're very grateful and uh, the the center of our religion is the atonement and his crucifixion um 
and then he kind of he goes on he's like I read something from Nephi and I read like all this stuff and you know related to the fact that we do believe in the cross like it is a big part of our religion still and then he was like I was about to quote Paul and I noticed that his eyes were starting to glaze over and he was like oh sorry I gotta go and left <laughs> and so um he says this morning some 50 years later I'm determined to finish that explanation even if every single solitary one of you start looking at your wristwatches so and then he says this which I think is really important to kind of put out there and I have also a little story that goes along with it um he says as I attempt to explain why we generally do not use the iconography of the cross I wish to make abundantly clear our deep respect and profound admiration for the faith-filled motives and devoted lives of those who do and that's really important um because it wasn't a really big deal to me when I was growing up. I was like, oh, I'd like to wear a cross, but like we don't usually, so it's whatever. And I remember asking my parents once being like, oh, we just kind of don't use it. Like that's just not really our, like that's not part of who we are and what we kind of do. And so, and also we have like, we have the CTR, we have the young women's medallions and the young women's like torch. And so I, I still had things that I could wear that that um, allowed me to still kind of show my faith and it's a symbol of my faith. And I think that's really what this whole conversation is about. It's not like, well, why don't you wear the cross? It's more of a curiosity of like, well, why don't you, why, why, why don't you? You know, what else do you use to show your faith? And we are, as, as human beings, we are always looking for ways to relate to people. And we are always looking for ways to understand one another and to like, to, yeah, to relate, to understand it. So like you walk up to somebody and they're wearing a cross that usually signifies that they are Christian um, or they have some sort of affinity to Christ, right? And so then that clicks in your brain of like, oh, I, I can relate to this person in some way, right? In the same way that if you walked up to somebody and they were wearing, um, I don't know, they're wearing a Harry Potter t-shirt, then you'd be like, oh, you like Harry Potter? Oh, cool, me too. Um, and also the same way for us, we are yearning to be understood and to show who we are and to relate to others. And so wearing something like a cross or my CTR ring, or whatever it may be, I'm wearing a Harry Potter shirt, <laughs> or, you know, something like that, we are yearning to be understood, and to be seen by people, and be able to relate to people when they say, hey, you're Christian, or hey, you like Harry Potter, or hey, I know that CTR ring, are you a member of the church? Like we kind of are all yearning for that. And so especially when, you know, we are Christian and we are so adamant about, we've had to be, be like, we are Christian, we are, we are, we are, for people to be like, well, then why don't you use the cross? Um, and also I think it's important to understand that like you don't, you, it's not that you can't, you can, you can absolutely wear the cross. I had a companion on my mission who had a cross necklace that she loved wearing. She still wears it. And she talked to me after this, we were talking on the phone or something, and she was like, all of my family gave me a hard time. Like we, they were, you know, watching it and they were texting me like, haha, like they're talking, he's talking about you kind of, you know, jokingly. And she's like, it, it's, it's important. She's like, I've had people ask me in the church why I wear it. And she's like, it doesn't say anywhere that we can't. Like, it's not like it's a, a rule that we can't ever wear cross necklaces or bracelets or whatever it may be, right? Um, but his the rest of his talk is all about, like, we, why we generally, like he said, why we generally do not use the iconography of the, of the cross. So, the first reason that he gives um, is, like, it stems from our biblical roots that crucifixion was a very hard terrible way to go <laughs> um which i i can imagine right you think about i think we've 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 desensitized ourselves to the the image of cross of christ on the cross 
and then you actually think about the what that would mean physically and how that would feel physically of course Christ was um he was crucified a little bit differently usually they would tie them onto the cross um and he was nailed but still like you're strapped like this all of your body weight is hanging on your arms and your feet um and that's how you die <laughs> like they just leave you there and people watched that was a that was a pastime was people would watch um what do they call it um well crucifixions but i'm thinking of the other word um we still do it executions that's the word we still watch executions right we like they have viewing rooms in prisons to watch executions for the death penalty and people would go and watch they would watch hangings they would watch crucifixions and so um he talks about how like it was one of the most agonizing forms of execution and so a lot of the early followers of christ didn't want to highlight that brutal suffering and like bring even more weight to that right um and so obviously christ's death and atonement is still was still a huge part of who they were and their faith in christ the early early christians um but for like 300 years they they didn't they chose not to use that that icon that symbol um and so he goes on to talk about it was in the fourth and fifth centuries that the cross was being introduced as a symbol of generalized Christianity. Um, you know, I'm just going to read this whole paragraph so that I'm not trying to like paraphrase so that he'll, he'll say it much better than I am. He says, by the fourth and fifth centuries, the cross was being introduced as a symbol of generalized Christianity, but ours is not generalized Christianity. Being neither Catholic nor Protestant, we are rather a restored church, the restored New Testament church. Thus, our origins and our authority go back before the time of councils, creeds, and iconography. In this sense, the absence of a symbol was that was late coming into common use is yet another evidence that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a restoration of true Christian begin beginnings. Um... I think this is a good point too, right? Like we are um, the the restored Church of Jesus Christ. We are the restored New Testament Church, and so the fact that they didn't use that makes kind of a lot of sense, right? That we don't you we also don't use that um, icon and sim sim symbology. I don't think that's a word. <laughs> that symbol, <laughs> um, and. You know those creeds the the nicene creed the all of the you know coming together of christianity and catholicism and the long history of christianity between you know the death of christ and his apostles and the restoration we we talk about that as an apostasy we we refer to that as the great apostasy that there were fractions and and like pieces of the truth but not everything and people were relying on their their own memory because they didn't have somebody to lead they didn't have a prophet they didn't have a, a you know a revelation for the whole world you know they were still being led by god their own faith and their own you know relationship with god but you know as an organized group of people they're a little lost <laughs> and so there was a lot that was left out in the Nicene Creed. There, like that was so the Nicene Creed. I make sure I say this correctly, um, so that I'm not like <laughs> saying this wrong. But basically, as a let's see. Nicene Creed, it was first adopted by the Council of Nicaea in 325. Uh, it was amended later, it was amended a couple times. Um, but it's the statement of belief or of Nicene or mainstream Christianity um, and those Christian denominations that adhere to it. So it's a profession of faith 
required of those undertaking important functions within the Orthodox and Catholic churches. So it's basically like, kind of like our articles of faith, right? Our, our thoughts, we don't, we don't have to profess that when we're baptized, but like a laying out of kind of what we believe. I think President or Elder Holland talks about that in that talk that I mentioned when he talks about like why we're not considered Christians or why we are considered Christians is a lot of it has to do with the Nicene Creed and like the beliefs that are laid out in that that are generally accepted as what you believe when you're Christian, no matter what denomination you're in. Um, even though this does specifically you know, refer to Catholicism and like Orthodox religions. Anyway, um, so yeah, so that would also make sense, right? That we just, we adhere to what they did in the beginning of the, like the beginning, the roots of Christianity, the ancient church. Um, and then he says this as well kind of his like third reason he says another reason for not using icon icon iconized I hopefully I'm saying that right iconized crosses is our emphasis on the complete miracle of Christ's mission his glorious resurrection as well as his sacrificial suffering and death so he's talking about you know the cross sometimes can just refer to, right, you just think about the crucifixion, the suffering, and death. And so, um, in emphasizing the whole of the, the resurrection of, or of the atonement, of the suffering in Gethsemane, Gethsemane, and the death on the cross, and his resurrection, that, like, that was those three parts, right? Um, that sometimes we can get stuck on just the cross. And I remember bringing this up to somebody actually on my mission. Um, she was a convert and I, I absolutely adored her. And she asked me this one time, she was like, why don't you guys usually like wear crosses? I think she had been Catholic or raised Catholic, something like that. And so she was very used to people wearing crosses. And so I kind of said this to her, I was like, eh, it's just kind of something we've not done. It's just not really part of who we are. And also like we like to um, emphasize all of Christ's atonement the whole thing his resurrection and not just his death and she looked at me and she was like well but the cross is empty the crucifix is the one with christ on the cross and the cross just the cross itself is empty and can symbolize that the cross is empty that he has he rose again and so that's an interest i also thought that i think that's an interesting way to think about it like um um that you know that that is also that is still a way that we can show and talk about and emphasize the whole of his atonement i also really love um there's a like an easter decoration that i've seen <clears throat> that it's a, a a it's like a oh my goodness why am i blanking and words are hard um it's like a statue statue's not the right word <laughs> it's like a figurine of the cave like the burial tomb um cave not the right word either tomb with the door rolled back and see the empty tomb as his um as a symbol of his resurrection and elder holland also talks about the the thing that the the icon that the car that the church uses and has really been emphasizing is the um <clears throat> see thorvaldson <laughs> um of the resurrected christ the right where he's standing and he has his his, his hands outstretched with the nail marks in his hands and feet how many places do we have that statue i can think of two temples off the top of my head who have them in or around the temple grounds or in uh, visitor centers the um the salt lake temple has it in their visiting center visitor center well they did before they started renovating i don't remember all that they're renovating there but um and i can also think of the paris france temple has it on their temple grounds 
a big massive version of it and i know there's a, a california temple that also has it but i'm blanking because i i the last time i was there i was like five <laughs> but i remember like walking up to it and i have a picture of me actually um when my family went to drop me off at the mtc we stopped uh on the salt lake temple grounds and went into the um it's my first time on the temple grounds the salt lake temple grounds i've actually never been into the salt lake temple <laughs> fun fact but we went into the visitor center and i have a picture in my like my missionary dress with my I don't, I don't have my name tag yet but like my blazer and my dress looking up at the statue of christ and of course we've as um we've we've put that into our um a lot of our branding as a church it's weird to think about it as branding but it definitely is um as our you know icon that shows up and as the thing that's on the gospel library app and everything that used to be the angel moroni and it's now the rest the resurrected christ and so that's my first kind of question for you to think about is how can you emphasize the full atonement suffering crucifixion and resurrection because because of this, and also just like my own personal experience as a member of the church, um, as a child growing up in primary and young women's, we often, um, I feel like we often simplified the atonement um, in a way that limited how I viewed the atonement and how I learned about it. And I'll explain that. <laughs> so I was always taught, you know, that Christ suffered in Gethsemane for your sins. And then he died for your sins and was resurrected. So that we will be resurrected. Um, he overcame physical and spiritual death, right? Um, so that we can live again, both spiritually and physically. That we can, we can repent and we can be resurrected. Um, which obviously... <laughs> both very important key the thing that that's the reason that the atonement exists right is so that you know we are in a fallen world we um we exist in a fallen world sin is gonna happen it's part of life it's part of the plan um, but that all separates us from god and physical death separates us from god um and so that is the fix, right? <laughs> he is the solution. He is the fixer. Anyway, so last, I think it was the last episode, I talked about, uh, there's a line in my patriarchal blessing that talks about, you know, one day you will stand in total awe of all Christ has done for you and you will understand the full weight of his atonement in your life. And, I'm, and I said, I told this story too, but I remember being uh, a little bit mad about that. I was like confused. I was like, I know. I, I know the atonement. I understand the atonement. Um, and I was kind of this like, really? I'm, <laughs> I already know. And it was very prideful of me and I have been humbled many times in my life since then. <laughs> um, but then I went on my mission. And I realized how little I actually knew about the atonement and how much there was just more to learn. Like, even though I know so much about the atonement, um, I, there's still so much to experience and to understand how it really impacts my life. And so that was really the thing that I learned uh, as a missionary in the MTC and in the field was that other part of the the atonement the other part of it is he suffered not just for our sins but he felt everything our affliction our joy pain sadness grief and not just that he felt that as a human being but he felt that as me he knows what it's like when i broke my toe as a missionary yes 
um he knows what that felt like and also like painfully physically and also emotionally and mentally how hard that was for me um to be in a boot <laughs> and as a missionary and to like like all these little things right and he knows what my anxiety feels like and he understands all of that so that he can be the best advocate for us that he can be so that when he's talking to God and he's like yes she made this choice but this is why and like that was just that that blew my mind and so how can we do that how can we emphasize that in our callings in the way that we bear our testimonies in the way that we teach our children and the way that we interact with people around us like how can we emphasize that full yeah the whole thing everything because all of it is amazing um so he also goes on to talk about he his last Kind of reason is he quotes President Hinckley, and I really love this quote. Um, he says, Lastly, we remind ourselves that President Gordon B. Hinckley once taught the lives of our people must be the symbol of our faith. So that's my, my second question for you is how is your life a symbol of your faith? Um, I think it's interesting. I was just talking to my sister about this. Um, how sometimes it's really easy to act like sometimes you can totally spot a member of the church in, in, in the wild, right? Like in a place that you are not expecting to run across a member of the church. Sometimes somebody will say something in a way that you're like, are you a member? Right? Like, you can just kind of hear in the way that they phrase things, the way they talk about prayer or receiving revelation or just, like, the things that they talk about. You can you can really see that. And I think also you can just spot somebody of faith that way as well. You can spot when somebody says, oh, I prayed about it. Or thank God in a way that's like, I am actually thanking God right now. I am praying to him out loud and thanking him for whatever just happened right now. And so how how is your life a symbol of that faith? Not what you put on your walls, not what you drive, not what, you stick, what stickers you put on your car, but like what you do, how you love people, how you interact with people. How is that a symbol of your faith? Um... So, yes, so he kind of talks, that's his like kind of reasonings and he goes on to talk about a few more things that I wanted to point out. Um, he says, you know, it has nothing to do with pendants or jewelry or steeples or signposts and it has to do with, you know, taking upon you the, cry, the, the, like the crosses, the taking upon us the cross, like take up your cross and follow me, right? Um, and he says this, this speaks of the crosses we bear rather than the ones we wear. To be a follower of Jesus Christ, one must sometimes carry a burden, your own or someone else's, and go where sacrifice is required and suffering is inevitable. A true Christian cannot follow the master only in those matters with which he or she agrees. No, we must follow, sorry, we follow him everywhere, including, if necessary, into arenas filled with tears and trouble where sometimes we stand, we may stand very much alone. Um, and then a little bit later, he kind of lists some things, um, you know, the crosses that people bear and kind of common common crosses that sounds weird but common crosses to people there and he says this as we take up our crosses and follow him it would be tragic indeed if the weight of our challenges did not make us more empathetic for and more attentive to the burdens being carried by others it is one of the most powerful paradoxes of the crucifixion that the arms of the savior were stretched wide open and then nailed there 
unwittingly but accurately portraying that every man, woman, and child in the entire human family is not only welcome but invited into his redeeming, exalting embrace. Excuse me. <clears throat> and I think that image is very powerful, and that kind of like reclaiming of the crucifixion, that it was a, it was a terrible way to die. It was a humiliating, agonizing way to die. Um, but that he calls it the most powerful paradox of the crucifixion was that his arms were nailed open. And as we know, on the cross, he said, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even as he was dying, even as he had been whipped and abused by these people, and then nailed, physically nailed, to a piece of wood, and watched as he died, that, um, that he still forgave them, and he still had his arms wide open, that even those who were so terrible to him, he forgave, and he invited and welcomed into his embrace. He continues to do that, that no matter what we do, there's always a way back to him. And he knows it. He knows us. He knows what we feel and why we doubt when we doubt and why we decide the things that we decide. Um, and he loves us anyway. And anyway, I could gush and go on for hours about this, but I really, it, I just really enjoy this talk, like to be reminded of that, to be reminded and to learn some things about um, the iconography of the cross and to think about that and um, like my history with that and my opinions on that kind of thing. So two questions I asked is, were um, one, how can we fully emphasize um, or how can we emphasize the full resurrection, the suffering, crucifixion, and resurrection, sorry, the full atonement, words, the full atonement, um, suffering, crucifixion, and resurrection. I really, really enjoy Alma 7 in the Book of Mormon talks about the atonement so beautifully, and he talks about the afflictions and like that he may know how to succor his people um, and not not just the sins but also everything else and the second one is how is your life um, a symbol of your faith and then my further reading for you guys find it. so there were some footnotes um that are in that i think are interesting to read through um most of them they're just like they're kind of asides like i've said before check footnotes because sometimes after the after the fact when they're published online or in the um liahona they add things and they make extra comments or references to things so i wrote down footnotes two six seven and fourteen um and then two talks opening opening the heavens for help by russell m nelson and the symbol of Christ by uh, Gordon B. Hinckley, which is where that, that quote comes from, that the lives of our, um, the lives of our people must be the symbol of our faith. So, um, that's all I've got for you. Thank you so much for listening to and or watching this episode of General Conference Conversations. Um, be sure to follow and share me, us, this on Facebook and Instagram. And if you like the show, subscribe or follow on your podcatcher of choice and tell your friends. Um, I, I, I really appreciate that. And a quick reminder also again about the study guide that's available. Um, those links will be below if you are interested in that. And I'll talk to you all next time. Mm -hmm.